The news on BBC One with Hugh Edwards and Matt Barbette. It's 10 o'clock. Israel has suffered its deadliest bomb attacks for almost a year. At least 16 dead, 80 injured after Palestinian suicide bombers target two buses. The Israeli government warned this evening it would respond with full force. Also tonight, former Telegraph owner Lord Black is accused of stealing hundreds of millions of pounds. The Royal Mail misses every official target for delivering the post. Wayne, what's it like to be a United player? Brilliant. Confirmed tonight, Rooney is off to United for £27 million. Pounds. In BBC London news, why Olympic success in Athens could give the capital's bid a boost. And the new Wembley is now half finished, but the Londoners still miss the old stadium. Good evening. After several months of relative calm in Israel, 16 people have been killed and many injured by Palestinian suicide bombers. The militant group Hamas said it carried out the attacks. The Israeli government confirmed tonight it would respond with full force. The attacks were the first suicide bombings in Israel since March, when 10 people were killed. The bombers hit two buses in the city of Beersheba. They're the deadliest attacks in Israel for almost a year. First tonight, Orla Girin's report from the scene, which contains graphic images of today's attack. Bersheva, mid-afternoon. No warning, no mercy. Suicide bombers strike two buses on the same street, just two minutes apart. A day of hell for this desert city. Lives destroyed here in an instant. Ordinary civilians just trying to make their way home. Many children on board enjoying the last day of summer holidays. Among the dead, a boy of three supposed to start kindergarten tomorrow. The devastation began just before three here at this busy intersection. Now, what you can see behind me is just half the destruction. The other bus lies in ruins less than 200 metres down the road. The strikes here carefully planned, carefully coordinated to cause the maximum possible loss of life. And at this moment, the dead are still being counted. Lives lost, Israel says, because this area is not protected by its separation barrier, so criticised by the world. This is the first time that this city was hit with such an uh, attack, which proves us uh, once and again that where there is a fence, there's no terror. Where there is no fence, there is terror. Inside the Israeli parliament, a leader with a new crisis. Prime Minister Ariel Sharon vowing to fight terror with full strength. Palestinian militants know this is the time to hide. The local hospital struggling with over 100 wounded. The Islamic extremists of Hamas claiming responsibility, saying this was payback for Israel's assassination of two of its leaders earlier this year. Back at the scene, the search for answers after the first suicide strike in six months. Palestinians say this. Israel has killed more than 400 people, civilians and militants, since that bomb. Now Israel making a swift return to fear. Four years into the Palestinian uprising, the militants can still strike. This is a conflict with periods of relative quiet, but it seems no ending. Orla Giran, BBC News, Bersheva. We can talk to Orla now. As you said, Orla, there has been a period of relative quiet, but it's not difficult to imagine what kind of impact this atrocity will have. Well, already, Hugh, it's having a profound effect on the psyche of this country. Uh, There is a habit that Israelis have of looking over their left shoulder whenever they go into a crowded place. But that is something that people had stopped doing in the last six months. You have to remember that for them, uh, six months without a suicide bombing is a relatively long time. So people were going out more. The pavement cafes were more full. You could see more parents with young children out on the streets. 
but I have to say that today in two minutes uh, that illusion of safety has been shattered. Can we talk about policies all as well because Mr Sharon's policy not least on building this... The Everton fans spelled out their feelings. Some of these people have been waiting all day just to catch a glimpse of Wayne Rooney and up until now Manchester United had done their best to keep him away from the cameras but this transfer has been one of the worst kept secrets in football. Rooney leaves behind the club he supported since childhood. In football, everyone has their price. Sally Nugent, BBC News, Manchester. The capital's bid to host the Olympic Games in 2012 is looking stronger than ever after the success of Team GB in Athens. The medals tally, boosted by the likes of Kelly Holmes and the men's 100m relay team, hasn't escaped the attention of the International Olympic Committee. It's hoped the strength of support from British fans set against thousands of empty seats at some events could just swing it London's way. This from Sarah Harris. Going for two gold medals. It's going to be an historic second goal. Kelly Holmes for Great Britain wins the 1500 metre title. The elation of bringing home gold, a feeling of pride brought to millions of British fans in the Olympic Stadium and back in the UK. It was all good news for the man in charge of London's 2012 bid. He knows something about being a champion, but must turn the golden feeling into a winning bid for the capital. He certainly has the backing of Britain's Olympic heroes. All our performances from Team GB will really help the bid. Uh, you know, it's, it's such an inspirational um, event having the Olympic Games in your country, so to have it in Great Britain would be fantastic. It would just take over the country, the country would come to a standstill apart from what's happening at the Games and I mean you just would never be able to imagine what um, it would do for everybody. It was the best British Olympic medal haul in decades. Nine gold, nine silver and twelve bronze, putting us in the top ten sporting nations. Experts believe the enthusiastic support in Greece and stunning individual and team performances will strongly enhance London's chances of securing the 2012 Games. In the capital today, though, not everyone's convinced. It will cost the taxpayers here with 20 or 30 years to pay for it. Uh, what's the point of having it here? I just think it was a wonderful achievement for a small team. So hopefully, uh, yes, it comes to London. The thing is, I realise it's finished now. And it's like I've gone home and I've gone to watch the Olympics and there's nothing there. I'm thinking, oh no, what next? What next? You know. So hopefully, we'll get it. Insiders say London is making ground on the Paris bid, which remains the favourite. There's no doubt the performance and passion shown by British athletes and supporters in Athens could make East London the ultimate winner. Sarah Harris, BBC London News. The new Wembley Stadium is now halfway towards completion. It's dominated by the Norman Foster-designed arch, which replaces the 80-year-old Twin Towers. In just a moment, we'll have the results of our poll, where we ask whether you prefer the new arch or the old towers. But first, what has so far gone into building the new home of football? Paul Curran has been finding out. Welcome to the new Wembley, which is massive in comparison to the old stadium. Take this stand. This is four times higher than the old stadium itself. Then there's the pitch area, which is twice as much as the old stadium. And it's all thanks to the new arch, which is so big you could actually roll the London eye underneath it. The arch is more than just a landmark. It will hold up the north roof and support much of the south roof. As a result, the new Wembley will have no columns inside the stadium. Everyone will have an unobstructed view of the action on the pitch. The FA hopes the fans will grow to love the arch as much as they love the Twin Towers. It'll take time for, uh, for the memories of the towers to be, uh, to, to, to be replaced by, by the arch, but uh, we're confident that the arch is such a dramatic addition to the skyline that um, it'll quickly get taken to people's hearts. There have been a couple of hiccups along the way. Work had to stop in November last year when the ground became too muddy. But in January this year, a worker was killed by falling scaffolding. The arch was due to be lifted in the spring, but defects in some welding meant that the complicated manoeuvre was postponed. Finally in May, the lift began. Over a matter of weeks, the arch was raised into position. But while the work went well, a contract row led to the manufacturer of the arch quitting the site. However, the main contractor, Multiplex, says any delays have been minimal. When Wembley opens in 2006, it'll be the biggest football stadium in the world. On average, it'll be three times bigger than the old Wembley Stadium. There'll be 2,000 toilets more than any other building in the world. 
and there'll also be more legroom, more than there was in the old Royal Box. The FA is still confident the new Wembley will open its doors on schedule in 2006. Paul Curran, BBC London News at Wembley Stadium. Well, breathtaking in scale, the new stadium may be with plenty of toilets, but the sporting public still seems to favour the old. In our phone poll, which closed two hours ago, 1,185 callers preferred the old towers, while 534 believed the arch to be a winner. That's virtually two to one in favour of the old Wembley. Now, a large-scale clean-up operation continued throughout today after the 40th Notting Hill Carnival, hailed as the most successful ever. An estimated one million people joined in the processions and street parties in what was regarded by police as a well-behaved and safe event. Just over 100 arrests were made over the bank holiday weekend. A police officer from the Met has won over £2 million on the National Lottery. PC Tony Stubbley, who's been with the force for 15 years, won the money in last Wednesday's draw. He says he intends to take a few years off and also buy a new Skoda. And now here's Peter Cockroft with tomorrow's weather prospects. Thanks very much. Rather chilly by the end of tonight. I think temperatures out in the countryside dropping to 6 Celsius, a mere 43 Fahrenheit. A little bit of mist around first thing, but a lot more sunshine on offer tomorrow, and it will feel quite warm as well. The sun rises at about 10 past 6 and sets at about quarter to 8. And that's the BBC London forecast. Football now and two results for you this evening in the Coca-Cola Championship. It finished QPR nil, Sheffield United 1 and Reading 1, Sunderland nil. Well, that's it from us for now. We'll be back tomorrow with the main stories in London and the South East in Breakfast on BBC One. But now it's time to hand you back to Hugh Edwards. Bye-bye. The main news tonight. Israel has suffered its deadliest bomb attacks for almost a year. Sixteen people were killed and more than 80 injured when Palestinian suicide bombers targeted two buses. News night's getting underway over on BBC Two, but from all of us on the 10 o'clock team, good night. Good evening. At long last, we had some summer sunshine today, and for many, a repeat performance tomorrow. But then it becomes a little bit more mixed towards the end of the week and the weekend. But the weather really has been a talking point here in the UK recently. It's now becoming a talking point across the other side of the Atlantic. Let me show you why. This is the third major Atlantic hurricane of the season, Francis. Just about make up the eye on this satellite picture here. It's already brushed towards Puerto Rico and it's now heading towards the Turks, Caicos Islands, the Bahamas in the next 48 hours. And then it has the southeast of the states in its eyes for the end of the weekend. Now, it is a very powerful hurricane indeed. Four out of category, out of five categories, so you can see that with winds unbelievably up to 140 miles an hour. So if you are travelling to the States or you know anybody going, it's worth keeping an eye on the forecast because it's likely to cause some widespread disruption, cancelling flights for a start. So thankfully, it's far calmer here in the UK. You can see this arc of cloud behind. I mean, that's the next weather front, which will be very slow to come into our shores, probably tomorrow evening before we see the whites of its eyes. And ahead of it, high pressure means a quiet night, a dry night. One or two mist and fog patches already starting to form, and they will linger through the rush hour, probably a few more than we had this morning. And a chilly night again. Temperatures low enough for a touch of ground frost, but a glorious start to the day, I think, for many. That fog will lift and break by the middle of the morning. And then it's sunshine all the way. It will probably turn a little bit more cloudy for western parts of England and Wales later, but the main difference will be cloudier skies for Northern Ireland. Still bright, I think, for the most part, just the odd light shower, the main rain coming in for the evening, so quite miserable by this time, and for western Scotland. But for central and eastern Scotland, a lovely day, just a bit more cloud in the skies. And it'll feel warm again. We've got light winds for the most part, 19 to 22 degrees Celsius. And it stays warm on Thursday, but by then it's a little bit more mixed. We've got that weather front making its way eastwards, so just the odd spot of rain, the odd light shower before it brightens again. But really it won't brighten for very long, well, because we've got more rain then coming in for Friday. It certainly looks like the wettest and windiest day of the week for the north in particular, with some heavy rain here and some rain for northern England, western fringes of England and Wales too. But further south it stays mostly fine and dry and it should do this weekend with high pressure building in. But there's some uncertainty as to exactly where this weather front will lie and that will determine where the rain is. But at the moment it looks like for most of the weekend it'll be across Scotland and Northern Ireland with England and Wales faring best with the sunshine. You can check Check out more on our newly vibe website. Bye bye.
The concluding part of Messiah is next on BBC One. Imagine a world where there are no secrets, no stories waiting to be told, and no surprises. Inside Out returns with surprising stories closer to home, because life isn't predictable. Monday, 7.30 on BBC One. The new issue of Radio Times has full details of forthcoming BBC programmes, together with complete listings for all major free-to-air and other television channels.